and the, we'll, I think we'll in and out over the next few weeks, and that's okay. Um, we finished up Vacation Bible School on Thursday night. We had uh, an awesome week together. We had somewhere in the neighborhood of, of between 45 and 55 kids each night that we were able to, uh, to pour the word into and, and to minister to and to love on, and we had... Uh, gosh, 20 and 30 adults each night to help us out. So 70, 80 people here each night uh, working through Bible school. So we had a good week. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your uh, your prayers. Uh, thank you for uh, for helping to, to do that as a church. This Wednesday night, we will not have service. Um, it's after class, it's the 4th of July. Um, so because of family events and out-of-town events and cookouts and fireworks and all that good stuff that we're going to uh, be with our families on that night. Wednesday night, we won't have um, our service. Don't forget to sign ups are, are back there that you can sign up to bring things for the coffee bar. You can also sign up to cover the nursery on a particular Sunday, and that is an awesome way uh, to serve. Um, it's it's, it's kind of on your timeline, right? You just sign up for a Sunday when you'll be available or when you want to, to be ready. So it's not an every Sunday commitment. It's not at all a time commitment, but it is an awesome chance to free up the nursery uh, for moms so that they can come and, and they don't have to continually miss the service and, and miss the word and, and miss what the, the Lord is doing in here. Uh, don't forget, we have offering baskets in the back. We don't take an offering in traditional sense, but there's a basket on the left for our regular tithes and offerings, and then there's a rectangular basket on the right um, for our building fund to sow into our uh, building and, and, and kind of build up some funds there that we have funds available to do projects in the future. Uh, one other item, uh, we're going to take up some money to help a family in need uh, that Whitney ran across from the past week or two, a uh, family that has a situation of a need. Uh, so if you would like to help sew into them and help provide some, some really needed essential items uh, for a, a family, you can see Whitney, um, and then she can, she can kind of plug that in and, and help make sure that the, the physical, tangible items that they need uh, that it gets to them. Anything else that we need to share and announce this morning on our hearts, on our minds? I was up late last night and then early again this morning reading, reading through some of the Psalms. And I read in Psalm 33 in the Passion Translation. I just want to read you the first eight verses of how they, they paraphrased or they translated Psalm 33. It says, It's time to sing and shout for joy. Go ahead, all you redeemed ones. Do it. Praise Him with all you have. For praise looks lovely on the lips of God's lovers. Play the guitar as you lift your praises loaded with thanksgiving. Sing and make joyous music with all you've got inside. Compose new melodies that release new praises to the Lord. Play His praises on instruments with the anointing and skills that He gives you. Sing and shout with passion. Make a spectacular sound of joy. For God's Word is something to sing about. He is true to His promises. His Word can be trusted. And everything He does is reliable and right. The Lord loves seeing justice on the earth. Anywhere and everywhere you can find His faithful, unfailing love. All He had to do was speak by His Spirit wind command. And God created the heavenlies. Filled with galaxies and stars, the vast cosmos he wonderfully made. His voice scooped out the seas, the ocean depths he poured into vast reservoirs. Now with breathtaking wonder, let everyone worship Yahweh, this awe-inspiring creator. I think those first couple verses are, 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 are intriguing to me, the way that it, that it talks about how we ought to praise the Lord. It says, it's time to sing and shout for joy. Go ahead, all you redeemed ones, do it. Praise him with all you have. What if we do that? What if, what if we actually praise Him with all that we have? What if we were as excited about what the Lord has done for us as we have what John Calipari has done for us? What if we were as excited about what the Lord has done for us as we have been about what our kid did for us at Eball? What, what if we just what if we just really got excited and said, man, I'm thinking about all the things that the Lord has done for me, and I'm thinking about all the promises that He's kept, and I'm thinking about His love for me when I didn't deserve it. I'm just going to praise Him and glorify and magnify and worship his name this morning because he's, he's worthy and he's deserving of it. Can we do that this morning? Let's stand up. And I just want to say a word of prayer. I want to step out of the way so we can, we can go into a time of praise and worship. We can really worship him with everything that we've got, just like Psalm 33 said. Jesus, we're thankful this morning for this opportunity to gather in your house and in your name with your people. We're thankful for all that you're doing in our lives. We're thankful for what you've done for us. We're thankful for the sacrifice of the cross that we didn't deserve. We're thankful for the ways you work in our everyday lives and for the, the blessings and the favor you continue to pour out on us and the, and the ways you continue to work in our lives. And so this morning, we're going to praise you and we're going to worship you because of who you are and what you've done and how we've seen you move in our lives. So 
Jesus, as we go into this time of praise and worship, may we put aside our pride, may we put aside our fear, may we put aside our worry, may we just begin to praise and worship you for who you are, for what you've done, because you're worthy of every word of praise and every song of worship we could pour out on you this morning. <coughs> Jesus, would you just inhabit and accept our praises this morning? In your name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
Somebody in here this morning needs to know that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. And you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If God be for you, who can be against you? And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I don't care what you're facing. I don't care what mountain is standing in front of you. I don't care if it seems like it's not movable this morning. God can make anything possible. But do you believe that he can speak to that mountain and move it from in front of you this morning?
This world. 
And that this is a story that tells us about the providence of God. So, so the whole story takes place in, in the book of Judges. And we said that that is like a super dark period in Israel's history. It's about a thousand years uh, before the birth of Jesus. And so if you go back to the book of Judges, which is literally right before the book of Ruth, you can read about that time period and, and, and the darkness and the, the depravity that kind of happened there. And so the story that we read about in the book of Ruth happens in the town of Bethlehem. Yes, that Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. And, and we discover that, that Really, ironically, there's a famine that hits Bethlehem. There's a famine that hits this town. It's called the House of Bread. And so there is no bread. And God is disciplining His disobedient people. And He's trying to bring them to repentance. And so we read this story in Ruth about this really ordinary family headed by this guy named Elimelech. Right? And he makes a really dumb decision. And because there's this famine in Bethlehem, he packs up his family. And he decides he's going to move them away from Bethlehem. Away from God's people away from God's favor, and away from people who worship God, and move them to a place called Moab. And Moab is a, is a, is a strange place to move, move to, because the tribe of Moab got started, right, when, when Lot got drunk and had incestuous relationships with his daughter, and he gave birth to a son named Moab. And that is the heritage, that is the descendancy that they had. And so the Moabs are all descendants of that incest, and they all worship this false god named Shamash, who requires human sacrifice. And so, of course, when Elimelech and his family pack up and they get over to Bethlehem, there's no church, right, to worship at. There's no Bible studies. There's no prayer meetings. Nobody knows the God of the Bible. Nobody is fellowshipping with them in the Lord, with his wife and with his sons. And so Elimelech really is a foolish man who's, who's only thinking about economic opportunity and money doesn't think about the spiritual implications of, of what it will do to his family for him to do this. And so if you've never met anybody like that, Elimelech is a man who places a higher priority on money than he does on spiritual things. Right? Jesus teaches on it over and over and over throughout the New Testament. That, that if we have a love of money, right? Money's not the root of all evil, but the love of money is. And when that begins to become our priority and our fascination and our prime concern, it will lead us down a path that we don't want to go down. And so they pack up, right? And they leave and they move to Moab. And they live there for 10 years. And the two sons get married to Moabite women named Orpah and Ruth. And no children are born. And then tragically, Elimelech dies. And then both of his sons die. And so now we have three destitute widows who have left their home. Naomi has left her home, and these two women are in their home, but they don't have a husband to provide for them. And in that culture, in that economic system, they were in a destitute situation. And so Naomi starts to hear God is blessing his people back in Bethlehem again. The famine is over, the harvest has come, and so she decides, we're going to go back to Bethlehem. We're going to go back to where God's people are. We're going to go back to where God is, is blessing. And so one of her daughters-in-law, Ruth, is devoted to Naomi. And she decides that she wants to go back with her so she can worship the, the one true God along with God's people. And then so she and Naomi, they pack up and they go back to Bethlehem. And so Naomi's friends haven't seen her in, in a long time, right? They're not texting, they're not tweeting. They haven't heard from Naomi, they don't know what's going on. And so Naomi comes back into town and it's like, Naomi, it's been a decade. How you doing? And Naomi says, don't you call me Naomi. Because the word Naomi means sweet or pleasant. She says, don't you call me Naomi, you call me Mara, which means bitter. She was unhappy. She was bitter. I'm, I'm bitter. I'm unhappy. I'm angry with God. I'm devastated. I don't like what God has allowed to happen. And so she just opens up and she shares your heart. But you know what? By being open and by being honest about what was going on in her life, she opened up an avenue where God could bring healing into her life. Can I tell you this morning that as long as you put on a front, and as long as you put on a face, and as long as you hide it, and as long as you act like everything's okay in your religious little painted white on the outside life, as long as you act like it, you will hold on to the bitterness inside. But when you begin to acknowledge it and say, you know what, yeah, this all is going on, and I need to bring it out, and I need to say, this is going on, and this is going on, and this is bothering me, and I need to let it out there. When you do that, you'll open yourself up to healing the way that Naomi did. And so in chapter 2, we found out Naomi and, and, and Ruth, they've got no food, they've got no money, they've got no help. They're in a desperate situation. And so Ruth asks Naomi if she can go and she can glean in the fields, right? 
If she can go behind the guys who are harvest in the field and she can pick up the leftover pieces of grain so they can have something to eat, right? That would be the equivalent of going to the food bank or going to the, the soup kitchen. And it was a dangerous thing for a woman to go by herself and glean in the field, but she's trusting God, right? That he's gonna that he's gonna protect her, that he's gonna give her favor in the eyes of somebody. And then we start to see one of these great themes of the book of Ruth. We start to see the providence of God. Right? We talked about how God works through two hands. He works through the visible hand of miracle, right? And, and the invisible hand of providence. Now sometimes God's work, God works through the visible hand of miracle, right? It's undeniable. You can visibly see it. He splits the Red Sea, or he speaks through a burning bush, right? Or a virgin has a baby who grows up and walks on water, right? All of those are visible things that we see. But sometimes God works through the invisible hand of providence. God is at work. God is on the scene. God is moving. God is active. But it's not in a, in a visible way. And whether we realize it or not, God is with us in our daily lives, in every little detail of our lives. And He's determining where people are living and where they move and who they work with and, and who they cross paths with. The, the providence of God is active in our lives. And so it just so happens that of all the fields that Ruth could have ended up in, she ends up in the field of a man named Boaz, who just happens to be godly and rich and generous and single. Right? And when Boaz finds out who Ruth is, he praises her because he's heard how kind she was to Naomi, her mother-in-law. And so Boaz prays for her and gives her a generous gift and says she can come back and she can gather grain every day until the harvest is over. He is so nice to her that it's like, mm, you know, butterflies, little hearts are popping up above Ruth, and it's like, ooh, this guy. Right? There's, there's this love is in the air kind of thing, right? Like maybe they'll live happily ever after, and maybe they'll get a cake, and they'll get a cruise, and they'll go out and have a couple kids, and they'll name a Buffy and Fluffy, and they'll get a poodle, and it'll be like the sound of music, and they'll all sing songs, and it'll be happily ever after. It seems like that's the way the story's going. But then it doesn't go there. For six weeks, for seven weeks, she shows up to work, and Boaz doesn't really do anything. Hey, Ruth. Goes on with his life, right? She does everything she's supposed to do. There's no callback. There's no set to date. There's no text message. There's no coffee. There's no, there's no dinner. There's nothing. So like a lot of guys, we said last week, he doesn't know how to close the deal. And so mother-in-law Naomi comes up with an idea. She says, here's what you do, Ruth, right? You go tanning. You get your hair done, right? You get your teeth whitened. You get your nails done. You shave your legs. You shave your pits so you don't look like Chewbacca. You get a new dress and you put on some perfume. And you go to the harvest festival where Boaz is going to be. And so Ruth takes oh, yes. and so Ruth takes Naomi's advice and she gets ready to go. And then Naomi gives her the freaky advice, right? And then Naomi gives her the weird advice. Would have been weird today in that culture and time it worked. But she says, here's what I want you to do. Don't talk to Boaz, right? Don't go in and just throw yourself at him and be like, hey, Boaz, don't do that. Right? Don't even acknowledge him. Just let him go to the party. Let him eat his wings. Let him watch the game. Let him hang out with the guys. And as the night goes on, he's going to get tired. He's going to go to bed. When he goes to sleep by his giant pile of grain, go uncover his feet and lay down and sleep at his feet. Well, okay, right? That's what she does, right? She waits until Boaz lays down. Boaz goes to sleep. And she uncovers his feet, and she lays down beside his probably stinky feet, right? And she goes to sleep. The Bible says that about in the middle of the night, about midnight, Boaz wakes up and says, Who that? There's somebody sleeping in my feet, and they weren't there when I went to sleep. And so he, he calls out, and he's like, Uh, who's there? Right? And Ruth says, It's me. It's Ruth. She says, Spread the cover of your garment over me, since you're my family redeemer. Which is another way of saying, well, you take care of me. Which was another way of, of really saying, I love you, will you marry me? Right? I want to be your wife. And we can make some babies that will be beautiful. And we can have an awesome life together like Boaz. Could, could we do this thing? And Boaz is a little surprised that she's even interested in him. He's older than her. Right? But he is definitely interested in her. He just didn't really think that there was an opportunity for this. And so he says, okay, done. I'd love to marry you. But there's a complication. He's not legally first in line to marry her. And so under the laws of that time, there's another guy who actually has the legal right to marry Ruth. And the Bible doesn't give that other guy a name because he's a turd. And so we're going to call him Mr. Watts-His-Face rather than Mr. Turd. Um, so Boaz has to go and he has to deal with Mr. Watts-His-Face. 
so that he can promise to marry Ruth. And that's where we left off the story last week, right? Ruth is sleeping at Boaz's feet, down in the stink, in the next of the grain pile. Wakes him up and freaks him out and says, hey, will you marry me? And he says, absolutely, but there's somebody else in line first. We've got to take care of that. And that's where we left <laughs> off last week. Before we jump into chapter 4, uh, before we dive in and look at this thing, some of you this morning are single. And some of you are going to find that, that when, when you love somebody, there's almost always going to be an obstacle that stands in the way of getting married, right? There was an obstacle that stood in the way of Ruth and Boaz finally getting married. That obstacle could be debt. It could be kids from another marriage. It could be job situations. It could be other problems, patterns of sin or addiction, geographical separation. But whatever it is, talking about God's providence, I really believe God in His providence allows these things to happen. And I believe God does that for two reasons. First of all, it allows you to settle the issue in your own heart of how devoted you really are to that person. Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to, to work through it? Are you willing to pay the price and endure to be with that person? <coughs> Secondly, it reveals to that other person the depth of your commitment. If, if he or she knows that you're willing to go through this and overcome that and work through this obstacle and overcome this financial difficulty and this, this geographic limitation, that, 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 that he or she must really love me because they're willing to go above and beyond the call of duty to be with me. The point is, when you meet the right person, don't expect it to work out easy, right? Sometimes we read the story of Ruth and Boaz and we're like, man, I just want a Boaz. Right, I just want a Boaz to come into my life and sweep me off my feet and have everything that I need in life. It wasn't perfect, right? He wasn't even first in line to marry. There was an issue. There was a problem that they had to work through, but they both sought after God and loved God and worshiped God, and they worked through it together. Don't wait on the perfect situation where there's no problems and there's no issues. It doesn't exist. Wait on the person that God has for you. So let's jump into chapter 4, verse 1. Now Boaz, we said the last couple weeks, the Boaz means mighty men of strength, had gone up to the gate and sat down there. Now, I want you to remember that Boaz was sleeping next to his pile of grain, right? He was so closely guarding that pile of grain that he would sleep in the floor next to it to make sure that nobody came and took it until he decided he wanted Ruth. He wanted Ruth. And he jumped up and he left the grain behind and he went out to the gate of the city, right? This is after they had 10 years of harvest, or of famine. So the harvest is incredibly important. It is the source of his wealth. It is, where, it is where his livelihood and his food comes from. And yet, Boaz jumps up and leaves behind the grain to get to the gate to take care of this issue with Ruth. Because he made her a priority over his livelihood, over his job, over his financial situation. You need to hear me, guys, that we do that for people that we love. We place them in a, prior, a place of priority over those other earthly things. Because Ruth is now her, his priority, and he wants to marry Ruth right now. And the gate of the town, when you went to the gate of the town back in this day, that was like the meeting place. That was where you socialized, but it's also where business transactions took place. And so first thing in the morning, Boaz gets up, he leaves behind his grain and all his stuff, and he goes out and he's going to find Mr. Watson's face. <laughs> then it says, and behold... The Redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. Well, isn't that just interesting, right? Whole town of Bethlehem, as soon as Boaz goes to the gate, Mr. Watson's face, the other Redeemer that had the rights to Ruth, just happened to walk by. Providence of God at work, right? As soon as he sits down, the Bible says, who comes out? But Mr. Watson's face. And Boaz sits down, and here comes this family guard, guardian that he mentioned, and he, and he comes along, and the, and the providence of God is working behind the scenes to make all of this happen. Because Boaz was honorable with Ruth, remember? Beautiful woman laying down next to him in the middle of the night. He doesn't make an advance on her. He doesn't try to take advantage of her. He prays for her and protects her reputation, right? Because Boaz was honorable with Ruth on the threshing floor, God, he obeyed God, and so God begins to bless his next steps. God begins to pour favor out on what he's doing. And so along comes Mr. Watson's face as soon as, as soon as Boaz gets to the gate. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. <laughs> So he grabs ten guys who are elders in the community and says, you and you and you and you and you and you, all right, sit down. I need you. We've we got to do something legal. We've got to take care of this right now. Verse 3. 
Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Bide in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it, and I come after you. Now, Mr. Watson's face is a loser. Right? I already told you he was a turd. And some of you are going to say, well, now, Josh, that's kind of mean. You don't really know his story. Yeah, I know. But why is he a loser? Because he is legally and spiritually obligated. As the closest living male relative of Naomi and Ruth, he is legally and spiritually obligated to take care of them. Right? We talked about this last week. Because he was the kinsman redeemer. Because he was the family guardian. He was supposed to help them out. But at this point, he's still done nothing for these women. They're living in poverty. It's a small town. He probably only lives a mile or two away. He doesn't go to visit. He doesn't call. He doesn't ask, how are you doing? Do you need any food? Your husbands are dead. Can I pray? He doesn't do anything. This is a man who has abdicated, who has given up his responsibilities. And some of you might look at him and be like, he's not a bad guy. He didn't do anything wrong. You see, there are two types of sins I think we need to be aware. There are sins of commission, right, where we do a bad thing, but there are also sins of omission, which is what this guy is, where we don't do something when we ought to be doing something. So, so he's a loser, but he really likes land. So at the end of verse 4, he says, and he said, I will redeem it, right? And Boaz says, listen, not so fast, but before you get involved in this thing, you should know that there are some strings attached to this whole situation. Verse 5. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Boaz is saying, Now before you get all excited about some land, let me tell you what's coming with this thing, right? You get a new wife, you also get a bitter mother-in-law, right? Like you think about, you're looking in a new house, and you walk in and you look around and you think, man, this is a sweet house. This place is awesome. It's a good value. I wonder why it's so cheap. And the realtor says, well, upstairs in the master bedroom, there's a bitter old woman. And she goes with the house, right? She stays. You've got to keep her. You've got to let her stay in there. You, you don't get to get rid of her. You don't get to knock her off. She's got to stay here, right? And you also have to marry her daughter-in-law, Right? Because her, her son died. And you have to have some more kids and you've got to support them all. Right? Then you might say, you know what? This house is not as nice as, as I thought it was. This is not as good a deal as I thought it was. And suddenly you lose interest. That's what happens with Mr. Watson's face. Initially he's like, more land? Land is valuable. We live in a great society. Absolutely sign me up. I will redeem them and I will take the land over. But now he's going, you know what? I already got a wife. I already got one mother-in-law and nobody needs two. And so I've already got some kids. This deal is sounding like an awful lot of trouble, right? That's an awful lot of mothers-in-law to support. And so I've already done the kid thing, right? They stay up all night. They take up all your time. They take up all your money. And at first they're like sprinklers. And fluid is coming out of every hole that they've got for the first couple of years. And then they grow up. And they're going to want to share the inheritance that I've already promised to my other kids. And so Mr. Watson's face takes it over. And amazingly... He has a change of mind about his, this deal. Verse 6. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. These people really like feet, right? Ruth is sleeping in Boaz's feet, and then they're taking off their shoes, and they're giving them to each other. But this is the way that they did a legally binding contract back then. Today, we would like, actually sign a contract, right? We'd have a notary come in and sign it and put their stamp on it. But back then, they gather witnesses, right? Boaz calls for ten elders to come and, and sit around them. And then they, to seal the deal, they would take off their sandal, and they'd give it to the other person. And that was their public declaration that they had sealed the deal, right? And some of you, some of you women are thinking, man, I would not want to do business back then because my shoe collection would, would be jacked up, right? I would only have half a pair of shoes of all these shoes that I really like. Verse 9. 
Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech, and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon, those are the sons. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. Then I love this next part. The elders that the Boaz has gathered around, those ten dudes, that Boaz has gathered around to be witnesses and, and watch what happened in this legally binding transaction, they start to pray for them. First, they pray for Ruth. They say, May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together build up the house of Israel. Now, Rachel and Leah are the mothers of the, of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're the, they're the matriarchs. They're the most respected women in Israel's history. And so Ruth, think about it, Ruth goes from Moabite outsider, right, to the highly respected matriarch inside. God's providence was at work. This woman from the, from the godless town of Moab has now been redeemed and put in a place where, where people are speaking blessings over her that she'll be like Rachel and Leah. Then they pray for Boaz. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. What they're saying is, Boaz, you are a great guy, and we all know it. You're good in business. You love people. You're generous. You're kind. You bless everybody. We pray that you continue. We pray that you, that you keep it up. Some people in life will, will, will get off to a good start in their life or in their marriage or in their family or in their relationship with God. They get off to a good start, but then they get off track. Would that describe you this way? Right? Continue. Keep it up. Don't get off track. Don't let the enemy lure you off the track that God has for you. The Apostle Paul tells us we want to run our race well. We run it all the way to the end. That we don't want to stop short. That we don't want to get off track. That we want to run the race and finish our life well. So they pray, pray Boaz, keep this up. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't mess this up. God has provided and now you have got to continue. And then the last thing they pray is for the children that will come through. In verse 12. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Boaz and the people of Bethlehem are descendants of Perez. And so this is a great honor. Those of you who are single and want to get married, not everybody's going to get married, right? Jesus himself was not married. But statistically, 90% of people will get married in their life at some point. And my, my question for you this morning, if you're single, if you're unmarried, is this. Are you living your life in a way to prepare yourself for marriage? And I just want to ask you some personal questions. And I want to challenge you. And these questions will apply to married folks as well. First thing is this. If you're dating somebody who does not love Jesus, why are you doing that? If you're dating somebody who does not love Jesus, right? Why would, you, why would you get romantically entangled with somebody who doesn't love Jesus? That is not going to lead you to the marriage that you want. Next question. When you get married, do you want to have a, a holy, satisfying, blessed love life with your spouse? Right? That is a wonderful goal to have. Then ask yourself this. Is messing around with your boyfriend or girlfriend going to achieve that? And will God bless that? He won't. Another question is this. If you're working a dead-end job just because you're lazy, is that going to prepare you to be a future blessing for your, for your marriage and your family? If you're racking up debt, is that going to prepare you for your future? If you're sporadic and wishy-washy in your walk with God, in, your, in reading the Bible, in prayer, or in habits of sin, is that going to help prepare you for your future? Is that going to cause God to, to have favor and bless the marriage and the family that you want to have? Because Ruth and Boaz lived in obedience godliness until God brought them together. And so when God brought them together, they were able to move toward marriage quickly. And even though there were obstacles, they were able to overcome them quickly because they were living their life in a way that God blessed and that enabled them to enter that next season of their life. Outside the four walls of this building, you're going to be encouraged in life to do what you want. You're going to be encouraged to do what you want and have a good time and do what feels good. But inside this building, as your pastor, as the shepherd of this flock, I want you to not think about a good time. I want you to think about a good legacy. Amen. 
I don't want you to think about what feels good in the moment. I want you to think about what's, what's going to be good in the long term and establish a godly legacy down the line for your children and your children's children. Don't think about what feels good. Think about a good legacy. Are you living your life in a way that will build a good legacy? If you're not living your life that way now, let me be honest with you, when you get married, it gets harder, not easier. And when you have children, it gets even harder. So the time to start building your legacy, really, is before you get married. Now some of you hear that, and you think, it's too late for me, I already want it. No, it's not. I want you to realize this morning, God wants you to know this morning, it is not too late for you. You have not done too much, you have not gone too far, you have not messed this thing up so much that God can't redeem it and use it and justify it and bless it and pour out on it this morning. He can still use you. Because you can change starting today. And God will notice if you do. He will be pleased if you do. He will pour blessings into your life if you do. As long as there's breath in your body, it's not too late ever. So ask yourself that right now. Am I living in such a way that it will lead toward the goal of my life? That it will create a, a legacy that I'll be proud of one day? Verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Finally! Right? We get to toward the end of the last chapter and finally they get married. And this whole book really has been about the providence of God. And, and, and with God working behind the scenes, it, it doesn't really matter where you come from or what you've done. If you meet Jesus, everything can and everything will begin to change. You can have a horrible situation like Ruth did, and you can still have a wonderful conclusion like Ruth does. The story starts with her, chapter 1, at a funeral. At a few funerals, right? Her husband and both her sons died. And it doesn't get any sadder than that, but it's a beautiful story of redemption. We see her in chapter 1 as a foreigner and an immigrant. We see her in chapter 2 as a broke, lowly servant. We see her in, in chapter 3 as an honored, respected servant. And now, chapter 4, we see her as a beloved wife and a mother. And so the rest of that verse says, And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. So they got married. They had relations for the first time, right? And she bears a son. At our church, we would encourage you, hey guys, don't be, I just want to explicitly state this, because I don't know, I feel like in 2018, sometimes it needs to be explicitly stated. Don't have sexual relations until you're married. Don't be sexually active until you're married. And then when you're married, make up for lost time, right? I'm willing to say that is our official position as a church. If you've already been sexually active, it's not too late for you. Jesus died for those sins too. He'll forgive you and you can have a clean, new life of holiness. Because the idea is not for you to go out of here this morning feeling guilty. right? The idea is we go out and we live our lives in such a way that we create an avenue, we create a channel for God to pour out His blessings and His favor on us. That's what happened with Ruth. Uh, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son, right? She had been previously married for as long as 10 years. We don't know the exact timeline, but we know the sons died about 10 years after, after the father. And how many kids did she have? She had zero, right? And remember that the, the, the children that you had, that was a status sign. That was a sign of, of blessing in those days. But now she's following God, and wedding night, what does she get? She gets pregnant, right? Ruth is not the only blessed one in this deal. The, the scene shifts to her mother-in-law in verse 14. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. They're actually talking about the baby. And she's sitting here, I imagine, I imagine Naomi sitting here holding her grandbaby at this point in the book. And they say, this baby boy, he's going to be a family garden. He's going to be a, a kinsman redeemer, just like his dad was. And then they say, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Seven, remember, is the biblical idea, the biblical number of perfection. In fact, in the scriptures, seven sons was, was, the, was the picture of a perfect family. And they say, Naomi, it looked like your life was destroyed, but now it's perfect. And your daughter-in-law, Ruth, she loves you so much that she's a better gift to you than if you had seven sons. And it's not only that good, but now you've got a grandson. It says, And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son 
has been born to Naomi. <coughs> Naomi has gone from being a bitter old woman to being a blessed grandma. Her life has taken a dramatic turn for the better. The final picture that we see of Naomi in the book of Ruth it is here she is holding her grandbaby, you know, playing with him, making him laugh, and rocking him to sleep while the women around her are talking about God's blessings and speaking blessings over that baby. And she's just in her rocking chair smiling and thanking God that her life has been redeemed, that she gets to be a grandma, that she's a blessed woman. And so as the, the, the women gather around him, it says they named him, it says they named him Obed. <laughs> Guess what? One of the definitions of Obed means, it means worshiper. Woo. They had a child who was a worshiper, and it redeemed the whole situation. Right? It brought redemption to the whole family. It brought redemption to the whole situation. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Right? Not only do they get a baby who's going to be a kinsman or demon, not only do they get a baby whose name means worshiper, they get a baby who's going to be David's grandpa. Right? Who is going to be have this great godly lineage and heritage. Because David, you know, fights a guy named Goliath, becomes one of the greatest kings of Israel. David is Ruth's great grandson. And so in verse 18, it starts to kind of give us that lineage. It says, Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Abinadab, Abinadab fathered Nishon, Nishon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. It traces that lineage that, that now, through this baby, God has redeemed this whole situation and given him this child of Obed. And from that child is going to come the line of David. And who's going to come down the line of David? Jesus. All right? If you flip over to Matthew chapter 1, I won't read you the whole chapter this morning because it, it gets like, it's like reading the Hebrew phone book. Right? Because it kind of gives you the begats all the way through until so you get to the, to, the, to the lineage of Jesus. But it, but it goes through, and by the time you get through those first 16 chapter, uh, verses of Matthew chapter 1, it shows you that from this line of Obed, from this line of Boaz, is going to come Jesus. And so in the same lineage, in the same heritage, in the same family tree, was Boaz, right, the Redeemer, who redeemed Ruth and Naomi's situation. But generations later down the road, is going to come Jesus, the Redeemer. Boaz was a, was a close relative of, of Ruth, and Jesus became a man so that he could identify with us and become a family member of ours. And Boaz was able to redeem, was the only one who was really willing to and able to redeem Ruth, and Jesus alone is able to redeem us. Boaz redeemed Ruth through financial power. Jesus redeems us through the power of a perfect, sinless life. Boaz was not obligated in any way to marry or redeem Ruth, but he was more than willing. Jesus is not forced or obligated to redeem us, but he's more than willing. Boaz redeemed Ruth out of love. Jesus redeems us out of love. It cost Boaz a lot of money to redeem Ruth. It cost Jesus his own life as he went to the cross and he died to, to pay the price for our sins. Ruth received redemption freely as a gift that she didn't do anything to earn. We've got to receive our redemption freely as a, as a gift that, that we can do nothing to earn. Boaz takes Ruth to be his wife and he loves her and he has a lifelong relationship with her. And Jesus takes the church, in other words, you and me, to be his bride. And he loves us and he has an eternal relationship with us. And then finally, the bride, right, Ruth and Boaz, lived in holiness and they trusted God and the bride of Christ, the church, is to do the same thing. So here's my question for us this morning. We've walked through the, the whole book of Ruth and we've looked at what God shows us and what it means and, and what it tells us. But I wonder this morning, what is God saying to you through the book of Ruth? We've seen over the past couple of weeks that it's a, it's a story of, of God's providence. But I hope that you see this morning... That it's also a story of redemption. I gotta go grab a post-it note. Bear with me. As we were worshiping this morning, I began to think about that word redeem. And so we were worshiping, and I just stopped to look up the definitions of the word redeem. And this is good stuff. Two definitions of the word redeem, right? And I want you to think about. It. Because I want you to realize this morning, Jesus wants to redeem you. Jesus wants to redeem your circumstances. He wants to redeem your situation. He wants to redeem your life as a whole. 
So, so two definitions uh, of the word redeem. Number one is to regain possession in exchange for payment. That's when Jesus saves you from your sins. To, to regain in possession in exchange for payment. Jesus wants to regain possession of your life. He wants to take back the ownership of your life. And he already paid for it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to earn anything. You, don't, you couldn't earn it. And you don't deserve it. We sang about it in that last song. But he loves you so much that he wants to redeem you anyway. He loves you so much that He wants to save you anyway. He wants to redeem you and save you this morning. And He brought you here this morning so you can hear this message. So you can understand that Boaz is a picture of Jesus. So that you can understand Jesus loves you so much more than Boaz even loved Ruth. That He gave His own life and He died for you. With no exceptions. Don't let the enemy creep in and tell you it couldn't be you. You've done too much. You've gone too far now. He did it for you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to regain possession of you in exchange for payment. So this morning, if you haven't been saved, Jesus wants to redeem your life. He wants to, he wants to redeem your soul. He wants to, to take you back and make you His in exchange for the payment He's already made. But even if you've been saved, I want you to listen to the second definition of to redeem. To compensate for faults and bad aspects. Do you have faults and bad aspects and bad situations and problems in life that you need somebody to compensate for? Right? That's what Jesus did for Ruth and for Naomi. That's what God did for Ruth and Naomi. He crept into a situation where they were broke and they were about to be homeless and they were destitute and they were poor and they were widows and they were in this land that they didn't know anybody and God brought them to a place where people are speaking blessings over them, where they have everything that they need, where they're going to be, the, the, the child is going to be the line of Jesus. God redeemed that whole situation when they gave it over to Him and began to be obedient and live godly lives. If you'll just surrender your situation, if you'll just give your problem, if you'll just give your faults and your failures and your issues and all your jacked up stuff, if you'll give it to Jesus, He'll redeem it and He'll use it and He'll work in it. He will, the word redeem, He will compensate for your faults and your bad aspects. But I said at the beginning, the enemy does not care. He couldn't care less if you go to church. He doesn't really care if you hear this message right now if all you do is hear it. He doesn't really care if it doesn't get inside you and impact you and change you. And so my question for you this morning is, what is God calling you to do? What is God calling, what action, what response is God calling you to take? God wants to redeem this morning. God wants to, to set free this morning. God wants to give liberty and give life and give freedom where we can hold and still and stagnant and question. God wants to do that in our lives if we'll just begin to give it over to Him and be obedient to what He's calling us to, just like Ruth and Naomi did, right? He took, took some guts for Ruth to go in and lay down at Boaz's feet, but she did it, and God blessed her obedience. I wonder this morning... How do you need to respond? I wonder this morning, do you need prayer? I wonder this morning, do you need to be redeemed? Maybe for the first time, you need to be saved. You need Jesus to come in and save you from your sins. In just a second, I'm going to stand over here. We'll be right here. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to talk with you. If you've never been saved, Jesus wants to swoop in. And he wants to redeem you. He wants to set you free. Right? He did it for McKay a few weeks ago. He did it for Joe in my office a couple of weeks ago. Jesus wants to redeem your life. He wants to take you back. He wants to take possession again in exchange for the payment that He's made. But even if you've been saved, Jesus wants to redeem your circumstances. He wants to redeem your life. He wants to redeem the calling that He put on you. He wants to redeem your mind. He wants to redeem your mindset. He wants to redeem your family. So this morning, the question is, do you need to come and respond to the call that He's given to you this morning? Do you need to respond to it this morning? Could we say... Because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is what matters. Are we going to respond? Are we going to be obedient to what the Lord is calling us to? If you've never been saved before, I'll be standing over here. I'd love to pray with you and talk with you. If you need to come and pray, please come and pray. And I would invite people, prayer warriors, please, please feel free to come and pray with people and speak into them, speak what the Lord is leading you to. I believe the Lord is calling us in, in, in this day to a moment of redemption. To say the same God who, who took Naomi, right, from bitter old woman who changes her name to Mara because she's so bitter, he changes her to blessed, happy grandma, rocking a baby whose name is worshiper, who's going to be in the lineage of Jesus. 
same God who brought that transformation in her life wants to bring transformation in your life. Are you going to give over control to him? Are you going to let go of the white knuckles? Are you going to let him have your life and your plans and the situations that he wants to redeem? I feel that I just need to say this and then I'm going to get out of the way so that we can pray. Some of you this morning have operated... Some of you this morning have lived and operated long enough under the guise of an orphan spirit. You, you have lived your life and the enemy has convinced you of this mindset of an orphan. That you were abandoned, that you were alone, that you couldn't be loved, that God couldn't redeem you, that God couldn't have a plan and a purpose for you, that, that, that you're just alone. I want you to know this morning, if you've been saved, you are redeemed, you are his child, you are loved. He created you with a plan and a purpose. And don't let the lies of the enemy keep you from the redemption, keep you from the redeeming plan of God in your life that he has for you. So this morning, I'm going to encourage you to come and respond, to be open, to be obedient, to be honest. You can stand here, we can stand here, and we can tap our feet and look at our watch and hum and wait a few minutes until we pray and go home. We can come, we can seek after the presence of God and what he has for us this morning. And that choice is given to us. Would you come and seek after the redemption that He has for you? If you have a circumstance in your life that you, God, you need God to redeem, come, bring somebody with you to partner in prayer and agree together. The Bible says that when two or three uh, are agreeing His name, that there He is in the midst. If you've got mountains in your life that need to be moved, come and bring somebody with you or come and somebody will come and pray with you and begin to speak to that mountain to be removed into the sea. This morning, He wants to redeem lives. He wants to redeem situations. He wants to redeem faults and failures. He wants to redeem past disobedience. He wants to redeem mindsets. Are we going to come and let Him do it? Or are we going to stay back and stay the same? If you need to be saved, I'll be over here. If you need to come and seek after Him, come and seek. Come and be obedient. Come and pray with people. But let's seek after what the Lord has for us. Absolutely.
Yeah.